So, Nicotine 2 is in the middle of an excellent video series covering the basic branches of ethics. Uh, I assume this is the summary of like his, the first week of his intro to ethics court class or something like that. I, I actually don't know if he, if he teaches ethics, but frankly, if he doesn't, he should, because he does a fantastic job. He puts forward clear, concise outlines of complex ideas, and if you haven't already checked out the series, I highly recommend going and checking it out. In his most recent video in this series, he summarizes virtue ethics and presents some of the problems thereof. Now, I consider myself a virtue ethicist. I did my dissertation on virtue ethics as it applies to animals in the 20th century. So I feel compelled to respond to some of his criticisms. Um, and to be sure, the criticisms that he makes are both fair and, and fairly standard. But, but I don't think they're as problematic as Nick has made them out to be. Uh, so let's take a look at a couple of his complaints. Virtue ethics provides less action guidance than other normative theories. It seems difficult to apply virtue ethics to actual problems. Take abortion, for example. Virtue ethics doesn't seem to provide us with much of a basis for deciding if abortion is morally acceptable. Now, strictly speaking, Nick is right here. Virtue ethics does provide less guidance than either consequentialism or deontology. But I would argue that this is actually not a problem for virtue ethics. It's actually an advantage. It's a, it's a virtue of virtue ethics, if you will. Uh, consequentialism and deontology tend to treat ethics as if it were accounting. All you have to do is plug in the right values for the given variables and you will get the right answer. But that's really not how the moral world that we live in actually works. Morality is a lot messier than that. Moral problems frequently have no clear-cut answers, and, and I think we should distrust moral theories that are blind to legitimate moral complexity. Virtue ethics recognizes that there are pluralities of moral values out there which are not reducible to a single common denominator, either something like the greatest happiness principle or the uh, categorical imperative. And that means that we can't just invent a moral calculus that will do all our thinking for us and answer all the moral problems in clear-cut, black-and-white fashion. Believe it or not, we actually have to think for ourselves. We have to use moral judgment. And judgment can be guided by rules and principles, but it cannot be rigorously determined by these things. And virtue ethics recognizes this and allows us and empowers us, I would say, to, to be able to use our judgment in this way. It makes room for it within the theory itself. And abortion is an excellent example of this. One of my favorite articles on both virtue ethics and abortion is, uh, appropriately enough, Virtue Ethics and Abortion by Rosalind Hursthaus, in which she tackles just this problem. Hursthaus thinks that the traditional approaches to abortion completely miss the point. It's not simply about what is the moral status of the fetus, or does a woman have a right to control her body. That's just way too simplistic, way too reductionistic. The moral, medical, and metaphysical realities of abortion are far too complex to reduce the issue to one simple question, or even two simple questions like that. Rather, we need to look at a host of factors. How did this woman get pregnant? Why is she considering an abortion? What are the alternatives? And is she considering them fairly and so forth? We have to look at all of these factors. So rather than a single simple verdict, abortion is permissible or abortion is impermissible, we will get a range of judgments depending on the specifics of the case. Depending on the circumstances, a woman who has abortion might be practical, prudent, considerate, courageous, wise, and responsible. Or she might be callous, cruel, flippant, self-righteous, shallow, and inconsiderate. Or she might be a combination of these things. And we can, of course, debate over exactly how these virtues and vices will manifest themselves in different circumstances, but that's precisely the point. Virtue ethics guides us, but it won't do our thinking for us. It recognizes the fact that abortion is a complex issue, and it allows us to have sincere, legitimate, real, honest-to-goodness disagreements within that context. Perhaps an even more serious problem is that some virtues appear to conflict. If being honest with someone will hurt his or her feelings, which virtue wins? Honesty or benevolence? Now, on this one, I think I actually want to quote Rosalind Hursthaus directly. This is from a separate article. This is from her book, her book on virtue ethics, in which she deals with the issue of conflicting, uh, uh, conflicting virtues. So, um, here we go. According to her, that is the proponent of virtue ethics, too many putative quandaries are merely apparent, not resulting from a conflict of uh, deontological rules, but too clumsy an application of the virtue or vice terms. Does kindness require not to telling heart hurtful truths? Sometimes. But in this case, what has to be understood is that one does no kindness by concealing this sort of truth from them, hurtful as it may be. An example might be a teacher is telling a dedicated, mature student that contrary to his hopes and dreams, he is not capable of postgraduate work and philosophy. Or in a different case, the nature and importance of truth in question puts the consideration of hurt, hurt feelings out of court, and that it is not unkind or callous to speak out. 
So, in short, again, it will depend on the circumstances. It's not always the case that the virtuous thing to do is to just tell the truth no matter what, nor is it the case that we should never hurt other people's feelings. It will depend on the circumstances. It will depend on things like the likelihood that deception will be discovered. How serious of a lie is it? How close is it to the truth? How is, is there ways to tell the truth that are more considerate of a person's feelings? We have to look at all of these things before we really determine what the morally correct correct thing to do in a circumstance like this is. Also, how are we to determine which human qualities are considered virtues? Different people in different cultures seem to value different virtues, and there doesn't seem to be much of a basis for determining if one of these sets of virtues is more correct than the others, unless, of course, we make an appeal to the outcomes of these different systems. But if we do that, we have just become consequentialists. The assumptions of virtue ethics are harder to justify on meta-ethical grounds than the assumptions of consequentialism or deontology. Now, this is really just the problem of moral relativism applied to the virtues. And within the liter literature on virtue ethics, there is a wide range of responses. Some people just bite the bullet and accept the relativity of the virtues. Some people try for a, a limited relativism in which there is a certain variability that's tolerated, but certain traits are either necessitated or excluded. I actually spent the first two chapters of my dissertation dealing with the meta-ethical foundations of virtue ethics, so I could talk for a very long time about this, so I'm just going to try to keep it brief. Personally, I think there's a fairly easy way of determining which virtues are best, and uh, the way of doing that is through a field group known, to as, po known as positive psychology. What is, what is positive psychology, I hear you asking? I'll quote two of the founding figures in the discipline, Martin Seligman and Mihail Csikszentmihalyi. Uh, they said, we believe that a psychology of positive functioning will arise that achieves a scientific understanding and effective interventions to build thriving individuals, families, and communities. Positive psychology seeks to find and nurture genius and talent and to make normal life more fulfilling." End quote. Uh, in short, there are empirical facts that can be discovered using scientific psychology regarding what patterns of life make us live better. Now, this trespasses, of course, on huge issues in meta-ethics and, and, and moral psychology, and of course, I don't have time to get into all of them here. So, let me suffice to say this. Just as there are empirical facts regarding what makes a plant flourish or wither, there are empirical facts about what makes a human being flourish or wither. Humans are much more complex, of course, and can tolerate a much wider degree of variability than plants. But at the end of the day, we can determine what kind of people live well and what kind of people live poorly, at least in principle, if not in practice. Now, as far as the issue about collapsing into consequentialism, this is the only objection that Nick raises that I think is utterly bollocks. Uh, why is it incumbent on the virtue ethics to distinguish their theory from consequentialism? I mean, technically, we were here first. I mean, so if, if by consequentialism you mean any moral theory that gives any moral weight at all to consequences, then fine. Virtue ethics is a form of consequentialism. I have no problem with that. I mean, the virtuous person will certainly, in at least most circumstances, give serious moral weight to consequences. Consequences matter, and our moral theories have to be able to make sense of that. But what distinguishes virtue ethics from consequentialism as it's traditionally construed is the idea that consequences aren't the only thing that matters. And this is, I think, where the real difference lies. Virtue ethics recognizes that there are other moral values that need to be taken into consideration. Virtue ethics tends to be pluralistic in this respect. And so this is the reason why virtue ethics doesn't collapse into consequentialism. Uh, it's the fact that the various virtues might derive their uh, value from good consequences. I mean, the idea of flourishing is, after all, a consequence of living in a certain way. But the proper moral psychology is much more robust than some monomaniacal fixation on maximizing good consequences. Okay, so that's my short defense of virtue ethics. Thank you again for the summary and criticism, Nick. I really look forward to seeing the rest of your videos in the series. Not, not